attentie, attentie, which is, of course, I think, Dutch for actung, actung. Um, it, it probably sounds sexier than that uh, if a Dutch person. I found that sounded it. pretty good. Uh, thank you very much, James. Uh, good morning, James Holland. How are you? Happy I'm New Year! Well. Happy, Happy New, New Year! Year. Happy, Happy New, New Year. Year! Yeah, it's a new one. Yes, well, it's what is it? Nineteen? What if if last year was nineteen thirty nine? Are we in 1940? Have we leapt forward? Yeah, no, no. We're still, well, okay, this is an interesting one, isn't it? Is, it? is it that we're just actually still in kind of early part of 1940 before the, the main wars started? <laughs> or or, or are, we, are we now at the beginning of 1945 where we still yeah. know there's a lot of slog to go and we've got to take a few steps backwards, but eventually we will, we will prevail and we will return to the sunlit uplands by May? Yeah, because I, you know what? Everyone else has given up on their Second World War analogies for coronavirus. Uh, pussies, but we're sticking with it. We yeah. are, God we are, damn it. <laughs> they're all lightweight with seeing, comparing it to the Second World War back in April. They've given up. Anyway, um, uh, a good Christmas, New Year festive season, James? Yeah, actually, um, remarkably nice and jolly. Yeah, no, I've, I've, I've had a lovely time, actually. Um, yeah. Apart from I've, I've had a filthy cold, which, you know, immediately assume is COVID. Oh, and then you suddenly remember that actually, you know, COVID, uh, colds and, and, and sort of seasonal flu does still exist. Yeah. Hand in yeah, glove with COVID. Yeah. Um, uh, but, I, you know, I, I've been sort of, you know, sniffing everything left, right and centre. And, um, you know, my dog still smells when she's wet. So it's fine. Oh, that's all right. Oh, that's good. So well, I, that's so I, don't, good. Think I've, I don't think I've had COVID. I'm no, still here anyway. So your, he- so your headline is uh, "Wet dog still smells." Bra- yes, breaking, breaking. Wet dog still smells. Fantastic. <laughs> yeah. um, now, um, uh, before we get into our, our main uh, discussion, we've got a few bits of news. Um, firstly, thanks to everyone who's responded so kindly to our Christmas readings. Um, uh, a lot of new books bought by the Santa Things, and um, books that are, are out of print that will we'll maybe, if we can. You know, Who knows? Uh, g- give publishing a Chinese burn. I'm probably not allowed to say that anymore. Um, uh, get get uh, some things published. Um, I, 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 I um, you know, I, I absolutely love The Englishman at War. I've been, uh, you, you read an extra, but I've been reading it anyway, the, the Christopherson stuff. And it's, um, it's so interesting. And so, um, you know, you get the, you get, uh, and uh, obviously, you've got to you've got to step back from one's own sort of national prejudices, but the, the, the sort of fundamental decency around those people, um, even in the middle of a like an absolute that winter is a bludgeoning, like uh, what slanging, a forty four forty five. Yeah, is a bludgeoning yeah. slanging match thing. Um, yeah. With you know, with the Ger- the Germans do you know are losing and are giving ground, but they're making they're making everyone pay for every inch, and it's horrible. Isn't it? Yeah. it, it uh, yeah. And yeah. yet they somehow, he somehow, I mean, maybe it's a, a quality he had. He stum- somehow seems to remain buoyant. And it's um, uh, the most extraordinary account. Yeah, well, it's interesting because because he's called Edward in Alamein de Zemzem yeah. um, by Keith Douglas, yes. which we've talked about before. And, and Keith Douglas paints him as a rather sort of superficially charming kind of, you know, yeah. sort of... Uh, one of those types you can talk about anything but but nothing of substance and it's all a yeah. bit kind of you know he, he's all a bit skin deep and I think I, and I think Keith Douglas totally totally misread him I think you know Keith Douglas was someone who wore his heart on his sleeve yeah and and so didn't understand what Stanley understood which was that as a squadron commander it was his job to lead from the front and lead from the front meant being sort of courageous but it also meant giving a mood to the squadron. Yeah. And, it, and it, it meant trying as hard as he possibly could to be as cheerful and upbeat and kind of yeah. come on chaps as he yeah. possibly could without being kind of sort of ludicrously gung-ho. He wasn't that sort of, you know, crack on, press on Guy Gibson type. He he, he yeah. just wanted to kind of light everyone up by kind of having this constant sort of upbeat disposition. And I think he was peculiarly well suited to that because I yeah, think he yeah. was by nature an optimist. Yeah. Um, uh, but but he what? Nor was he kind of, he, you know, he also had a terrific sense of humour. So um, he, he always kind of liked to see the, the the amusing side of things wherever he possibly could. And of course, there's all there's loads of dark humour and also just general humour anyway. Um, but what is absolutely clear, talking to David, uh, and it was a real shame, actually, because David and I did this absolutely fantastic recorded conversation when we were going around Germany back in October. And he was so good about his dad. He was just fantastic. And unfortunately, the, the sound quality just wasn't good enough for us ah. to be able to put it out as a podcast. Um, 
But David was fascinating in that conversation because he said there were just so many periods where his dad would just retreat um, with a big bottle and you just wouldn't talk to him for two days. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, yeah, yeah. and, and he, said, he, he, said, he said, you know, he was brilliant fun. You know, he, he was so much fun to be around. But he suffered horrifically from the black dog, something that he'd never suffered for the war and that was entirely due to what he'd gone through and it's amazing because right now I'm obviously you know, I'm doing my Sherwood Rangers book and the last couple of days I've been writing basically from D-Day to the 11th of June so a five day period and you're thinking Jesus you know that would be enough for me for a, two lifetimes just yeah. those five days yeah, it's yeah, yeah, absolutely yeah, yeah. horrific you just think about what it's like you're in this close country with these narrow streets in these villages orchards all around them hedgerows woods high ground low ground little snaking river valleys you can't see diddly squat and you're going forward in a tank everyone's on the net you've got infantry artillery everyone's also going blah, 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 blah. you're trying to talk to your own crew you can't see much you don't know the ground because you're advancing so you've never been there before shells are coming in mortars are coming in machine guns firing people are yep. shouting someone's been hit you haven't got a freaking clue where you're going you can't see diddly squat unless you put your head out of the, of the top of the turret in which case you're probably getting it shot off yeah and there's lots of smoke and it's incredibly frightening your senses are going absolutely crazy and how do you deal with well, that and you're exhausted. You and, and you had two hours sleep in the last five days especially correct if, uh, especially if you're an officer <clears> like him because you're up all night organizing everything anyway and writing letters and reading orders and writing orders and you know and so on and so on and so on and so on yeah the and on, on the 11th of june yeah uh, just unbelievable so on the 11th of june stanley is a squadron commander loses his second in command keith douglas killed yeah and uh, and loads of crews get knocked out tanks get burnt up they're burning for hours right in front of them you know it's thick smoke ammunition yeah. going off all that kind of stuff Two days later, so then they get pulled out that night. They go back into the line the following day, the 10th of June. On the 11th of June, the squadrons are all split up. B squadron's down in the village of Saint-Pierre. C squadron moves forward to clear the southern part of the village. A squadron's up on the hill on point one oh three. Suddenly over the net, it comes out, uh, you know, shells come in, hit regimental headquarters. CO, adjutant, intelligence officer, all killed just like that. Yeah. Stephen Mitchell, who's the next one in seniority, he's in C Squadron. He's already gone in, has gone AWOL. No one knows what he has. His tank's been knocked out, but they don't know where he is because he's had to bail out. And he's with yeah. the Durhams at that point, carrying a yeah. farmyard. Yeah. Uh, um, so Stanley has to come down from point 103 and take over that afternoon. And he just has to go, boom, I'm in the zone. I've, I'm, I'm now on it. And, and, and by all accounts, he, it's clear that he does an exceptional he, he job. He can do it, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, um, but, but, you know, Jesus... Yeah. You know, 32. Yeah. yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. And it's, yeah. I, 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 well, uh, that, uh, that's that been my favourite read over Christmas has been has been that book. I mean, uh, th- there's been, I mean, of the readings, uh, the, the Operation Bunghole has set people off. <laughs> yeah, that's um, amazing. Uh, yeah, uh, which is an extraordinary story. And, and, you know, a successful glider operation. Where they, yes. where everything, everything goes according to plan. I also thought the other really interesting thing in that, in that description is uh, it's Cornelius Turner, isn't it? He says, um, he says, you know, we'd never been trained to figure out how to um, load a glider, but we worked it out for ourselves. And they go and collect those, <laughs> they go and collect those horses that have been parked outdoors in the weather for ten months or whatever, fly them all the way up Italy. Then, oh, actually, no, these horses are no good because because the tugs can't get them over the mountains. Get in a Waco, do it, you know, re repackage themselves. The whole thing. It's just absolutely extraordinary. And these glider pilot guys are just they're, they're, they're nails, aren't they? And they're yeah. and again, it's this thing that there there was no glider pilot regiment um, three four years four years prior to that didn't exist didn't exist conceptually. The whole idea is complete like as a complete invention. They invent a thing. They get guys this good. And then by the end of the war, oh, we don't need gliders anymore. You're, you know, they sacked the whole thing. It's just extraordinary. All their expertise, all their like gumption and effort to pull to pull that thing together is just it's just amazing. Uh, yeah. uh, and um, what's Absolutely incredible? amazing. And and one of our one of our regular listeners, Darren Little, got in touch. Said um, uh, tweeted he uh, tweeted this morning, Monday morning. Said Tito visited my great uncle's squadron base, two six seven Pegasus Transport Command in Bari, um, and he and he's got his operations logbook. Fifth of fifteenth uh, of August forty four, Marshal Tito arrived at the airfield this afternoon at approximately fifteen hundred hours. All routine services were carried out without incident. So Tito, Tito dropped in, and then he's got a load of other stuff from this um, 
uh, uh, th- these ops room diaries, uh, um, all sorts of stuff, you know, and Randolph Churchill coming in and out, coming in and out of Yugoslavia, that whole channel out through, you know, once they're not having to run it from Alexandria anymore, once, they, once they're that little bit closer through Italy, obviously getting really, really busy with getting Tito on side. Uh, it's, it's so interesting. I knew nothing about that. Um, you know, and the Russians with his with his uh, crate of vodka and caviar under the yeah, under yeah. the seat. It's like what, what's in the box? Well, booze <laughs> and luxury. Yeah. Well, there uh, were yeah. Russians in there were Russians in in Italy the whole time, kind of observing yeah. and stuff at, um, yeah. at, at Allied headquarters. Uh, but I, I mean, I've got to say, I mean, you know, I've read Eastern Approaches and I've read my Evening War, but but the the war in Yugoslavia is is a, I'm, I'm not going to lie, it's a bit of a dark zone for me. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. I don't you know, know. It's just yet another little sort of blob of the Second World War, but which I've got to kind of do some, do some prep on. <laughs> right. Um. Anyway, uh, we have a couple more bits to do. Um, many of you joined us for our live stream last week, and thank you very much for taking time out of the most boring part of the year to join us. Um, I appreciate the sacrifice that involved. Um, although, to be honest, <laughs> I, I don't know about you, James, I found the Between Christmas and New Period less arduous than usual, because basically that's what we've been doing since March. It's in force, yes. fuck all. So I, I found that, you know, the the, the, the sort of taint, the bass between Christmas and New Year, I found that kind of um, less annoying than it normally is, you know. Yeah, I don't know. It's, I mean, it's been, it's, it's been right for me because, you know, sort of out here in the sticks, I can sort of go for a nice big hike and, you know, I can sort of get on with work. And, you know, yeah. because I've been around all this time and everyone's been around, there's not that kind of sort of, well, you're on holiday now. So yeah. I, I've been able to get back and get on with my writing, which I've yeah. been quite Well, London, and, London, on the other <clears> hand, is <throat> shut. <laughs> yeah, well, quite. So I, I have been wondering why, how you've been getting on, and um, I well, guess the, it's been kind of more Tiger Tanks and and and, and TV. And the attraction of living in London is that it's open. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, uh, so right now it's not really working for you. It's not really working for me, no. Anyway, um, so we did the live stream, and we were going to show you uh, Harry Birrell Films of Love and War. We were going to sit and watch that, which is a, the most amazing film um, uh, about a guy from well, uh, Ar- Aaron. Uh, well, it's, yeah, a, a bloke from Aaron who... Um, had a city camera from when he was a child and filmed his whole wartime experience. Unfortunately, the film was taken down on the day, probably because we attracted a load of attention to it. And uh, at least we like to think that we're that kind of influencers. Um, so uh, we all watched a, a really rather, I mean, a variable documentary about Overlord instead. But We had a jolly evening. We had a very jolly, a very, a very convivial evening. But fear not, we've organised with the filmmaker, the producer of Films of Love and War, and they're going to make it available to Patreon members uh, to the live stream on Thursday evening this week. So please join us on the live stream, 8.30pm UK time. Um, Harry Birrell's granddaughter will be on to talk about her grandfather and his time in Bur- Burma will be joining us on the live stream, which is incredibly exciting. Um, yeah. And again, uh, uh, one of those things that the, the churn <coughs> of the We Have Ways community, someone said, hey, you should watch this. this. is really cool. It's about Burma. I watched it. We passed it around. We decided to do it. She, Someone obviously wrote to her last week and said, hey, you know, these people are... These people want to watch your your um your film because she produced it. Want to watch your film your, that your with your grandfather's stuff, and so here we are. We're going to be able to do that on Thursday night. So that's a lo- rather lovely bit of um internet l- joining us all up together and getting getting us the result we're after. Oh, I think it's absolutely fantastic, and I'm really excited because I I you did send it to me, and I just didn't get around to seeing it. Yeah, you didn't see uh, it and yeah, then yeah. I kind of saw the trailer, and I thought, Jesus, what have I missed? So last week I was incredibly pumped to watch it, and very disappointed when we couldn't. And now you know, happy days. The stuff in Burma, his time of the Gurkhas, is absolutely bloody hell. Like, like, like a proper glimpse into that life. Um, uh, Can't wait. Right. Um, also, we've decided to launch a Facebook page. Um, not least because of the sheer amount of photographs we need to share with you. Hopefully many of you are following on Twitter and we'll carry on with that as our main communication method. But the Facebook page will allow us to just put a bit more stuff up there. Um, uh, so if you're on Facebook, please do get involved. Um, give our page a like and a follow and all that. As ever, just search We Have Ways on Facebook and there it'll be. Now, a significant news, of course, which is un- unignorable for this podcast. Uh, Brian <laughs> Urquhart. So Brian Urquhart died uh, uh, at the weekend um, at the grand old age of 101. He had the most extraordinary life, um, aside from his part in the Arnhem battle and the Arnhem story. He had the most extraordinary life. Um, you'll have seen his obituaries in the papers over the last two uh, day or two. Founding the UN, the White Helmets, just the most incredible thing. But of course, Brian Urquhart is a major figure in the story of the Battle of Arnhem. And uh, he wasn't present at the battle because he was tail rather than teeth in First Airborne Division, First Allied Airborne Army. Um, uh, uh, well, First Airborne Division. And But he's 
He is, of course, a, a major factor in the way the story of the battle gets told because he is Major Fuller in the film, in A Bridge Too Far, who says, I don't think we should go, sir. There's some panzers there that I've found out about. And he's presented as incredibly wet in A Bridge Too Far, I think. It's all rather, it's all rather um, sad the way he's presented. And he's an interesting character because, because it's, he is supposedly the guy who knows that two pounds of SS are in the Arnhem area, that tells Browning, and according to some readings, Browning then ignores it or ignores it or hushes it up or says, could we talk about something else, please? And in the movie, of course, tells him he's tired and, he, and, he, uh, tired and he can't come and all that sort of stuff. But, I mean, it's... it's it, or he's ill, he can't come. In his autobiography, which was published in 1987, Urquhart says, from the first inkling of it, an operation to take the great bridges across the Rhine Delta, Arnhem, Nijmegen and Grava, had seemed to me strategically unsound. Patton was going forward in the south against only moderate opposition and would reach the Rhine where it was one river instead of three. His tanks used enormous amounts of fuel which would have, been, have to be cut off if another large mobile op armoured operation were to be undertaken in the north since Cherbourg could not, be put through, uh, could not put through enough gasoline to supply both operations. An advance through Holland would take the Allied armies far north, quite apart from its probable effects on the fate of the Dutch population. The area between the existing British forward positions on the Albert Canal and the bridges was more than 60 miles of flat land intersected by canals and traversed by roads, which were essentially causeways. Ideal country for holding up an armoured or motorised formation. Even supposing the German army was completely demoralised, it seemed unlikely they would fail to put up a strong enough resistance on the borders of the fatherland. Now, that was written in 1987, so... I think it's quite interesting the way he puts all that. Patton, this is Ike's decision. Where's Bradley in this picture? And also, Patton isn't that close to the Rhine at this point and all that sort of stuff. And that very much feels like, and I, you know, it feels like a post-Bridge Too Far version of events um, a little. I don't know. It, 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 it massively does. And I think one has to appreciate that, you know, when you're talking about events 40 years after they've happened... You will have someone like Brian Urquhart will have inevitably have seen the film, would have have read subsequent books about all this stuff, and that does is going to inform your own memories. Well, it and, just will and, do. But I also think I also think uh, because he was part of the intelligence effort, and of course because of his story, and because it, it's become he he knew he told Browning Brown. You know, there's various interpretations of it, and 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 if, one of the things it's led to is this emphasis on that aspect of the intelligence that, that, that first Airborne had, rather than Ultra, rather than um, uh, 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 Sigint and other, and other stuff and humans and all that sort of thing, right? And, and, and so he's become sort of... They, they, whereas in fact, if you look at the timeline, it's the information about two Panzer SS that doesn't lead to the cancellation of Market Garden, like he says at Orta, it leads to Comet, which is the first airborne doing the whole thing on their own, being upgraded to Market Garden. So there's something quite peculiar there because, uh, and, uh, and, you know, obviously, obviously, this is, this is really interesting because, because it's Comet, which is being lined up to happen. And, and, and in fact, a lot of the Market Garden plan, for instance, First Parachute Brigade's plan, Gerald Lathbury's plan for taking the bridges at Arnhem, is the same plan as Comet. So the drop zone issues that they have for Comet are then inherited by Market Garden because they're in such a hurry. Yeah. They're in such a rush. <laughs> yeah. At, but it's it Comet is upgraded to Market Garden because of the All suspicion. The, the suspicion that there's a two Panzer SS presence in the in the Arnhem, you know, northern Holland area. And and so it's not that he goes to them and they ought to he goes to them and they go, oh oh fuck, we better then we're gonna have to upgrade. And that's a that's a very very different um, uh, uh, d sequence to, of events and uh, or interpretation of uh, uh, of what happened. But in his account, Urquhart never mentions Comet. Doesn't talk about Comet. I mean, I'd be the thing is, if you're him, you probably spent your life life furious that the operation went so badly. So many of your friends were killed. So much of you know that the thing was such a disaster, and that the people above made a series of bad decisions. So you. Uh, I can completely understand why he would go. You got it wrong, you bastards, and I and I had something that maybe helped. Y yes, would but have isn't helped. it also okay? So I can't remember how many pips. Is he got two pips or three at this point? He's but a I major. Mean, you know, he's major at this point. He is a major, is he? Yeah. Okay, so he's got a crown. So he's, he's but you know, he's he's 
he's still a comparatively junior intelligence officer in the big scheme of things. Yeah. And I wonder whether it's the kind of, you know, case of he knows his bit of the intelligence picture. Yeah. But actually, because he's quite junior, inevitably, there's loads of stuff that he's just not going to get. So he's yeah. he's going to be looking at it purely from the perspective of his, his own understanding and what intelligence yeah. picture he yeah. has got, yeah. rather than understanding this much bigger picture, this sort of uh, the political picture, the kind of, yeah. you know, a whole host of factors of which he is simply not privy. Well, I mean, after all, that, that idea that, that you, you know, extending into Northern Holland, extending to Northern Holland deals with the V-bomb problem. And there's a, there's a, in theory, there's an awful lot of, there's an awful lot of political pressure to do something about the V-bombs, about the V-bomb attacks, isn't there? Yeah. The V-1, two, V-2 attacks. Because of course there would be. Because London, because after all, the, 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 the most expensive month in terms of British casualties in the Second World War is, you know, months are June, July, August of 1944. Because yeah. you've got, a big battle in Normandy going, a big battle in Burma going, and a big ba- and a and a new blitz, and yeah. so of course there's colossal political pressure. So it makes it it, it makes tremendous. I mean, the thing is, is the the other thing is, is Montgomery himself says second pa- two pounds of SS corps were refitting in the Arm- Arnhem area. We knew it was there. He and he says this in his memoir pre ultra, right? So he says we knew, right? Pre ultra secret being revealed. And certainly pre-1987. And he says, but we were wrong in supposing that it could not fight effectively in a battle state. In battle state, its battle state was far beyond our expectation. Now, that's interesting because uh, because after all, when you delve into the battle, it isn't two Panzer SS that caused First Airborne's problems. It's Setcraft and his training battalion of um, of NCOs and 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 absolutely every able-bodied German with a rifle or a machine gun who's pushed into who's pushed into pushed to, to plug the gap. To stop them yeah. to form the blocking line, and and you know the, the spears blocking line and all that. So, uh, uh, um, so you know, there's. The, the, it's not all down to the two SS. The, the, it's the not all that... down to two SS. So it's not all down to knowing about two SS or not knowing or knowing or uh, you know. And and Lathbury's recollection of whether whether of. of of two Panzer SS, he says, "Oh, I didn't know about it, but it is mentioned in their orders, in brigade orders." But he also thinks, "But we're gonna." But basically, he's thinking, "We've got to get on with it. We'll use the Comet Plan. The Comet Plan will work." I mean, the really in- one of the really interesting things because I did a bit of sp- you know reading around, a little bit of tucking in, reading around this morning. Post Market Garden, the Germans write a report that basically says if they'd landed, if they'd not wasted all those men defending their landing zones. If they just concentrated their effort on the bridge, um, that would have worked. And we were very incredibly fortunate that the enemy divided his efforts so, right? Yeah. And they write a report like that. And the Allies capture that report in December of 1944, get their hands on it and go, oh, right, OK. And that gets fed into varsity. Amazing. The German report on what goes wrong. So, but, but I think it's, What's really interesting about this is, after all, is 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 it's one of those, uh, uh, you know, he is a, he's an incredibly important figure because he's an important figure in the story of the battle, and it yeah. just shows how, you know, I, I, when I went to Shrivenham to talk to talk to them about Market Garden ages ago, and I was sort of toying with writing a book, the first thing they said is, you've got to remember, all the main players. In the airborne establishment after this, were livid. They were furious that so many of their friends had been killed, that a division had been, had been, you know, crashed on the rocks of this endeavour and destroyed. They were livid. They were furious. So they were determined to find people to blame. They were determined to uh, uh, vent about how they felt about what had gone wrong. And as the years passed, some of them got angrier, and the stories became entrenched. Because after all, you know. It's who, exactly picks, Italy. who picks the drop zones when you when you know when you you look at who chooses the drop zones? It's not really the RAF. It's the army going because the the, the, the the airborne after Normandy right. There's a lot of concern at Normandy that if you land too close to your objective, you don't have time to form up and take it, and the enemy will interfere with that rather than uh, where well, you're on your objective, so you've taken it. But that's because it's night and it's got lots of confusion. So if you do yeah, it daylight, yeah, but, it shouldn't be so confusing. But there's all these, there's all these, you know, <laughs> conflicting. And our, and after all, the thing you said the other day about the Sherwood Rangers is the expectation that you'd be landing in good weather um, was part of the airborne plan. 
summer mm. weather, be decent summer weather in June. And of course, it was bad right, weather. Right, right. So the drop drops. Anyway, anyway, but Brian Urquhart, we, I think what, what I'd really like to do if we can get down the line on this is eventually is we'll talk to Sebastian Ritchie, who's the guy who's really looked into this and really looked into the photo reconnaissance side of the Urquhart story, the over famous overflights. Yes. Um, uh, um, what he found. And we're going to talk about photo reconnaissance in the second half that's coming up in a moment. Oh, that linkage. How about that? That was really good. That was really good. <laughs> See you in a moment, but. everybody. <laughs> right, welcome back to We Have Ways of Making You Talk, which ended on James, the first half ended on James Holland saying, but, how fantastic. So, <laughs> So my butt is before we go on photo <laughs> reconnaissance and photo um, and aerial yeah. photographs. I, I can't let uh, an article oh. in the Times this morning. Be ignored. Oh. Okay, so this is yet again kind of poor old Frank Whittle, who was sort of you know no one listened to him. If only they had, it could have stopped the blitz. So what they found. So so his latest biographer, I think he's written this book called Jetman, which is coming out any minute. Jetman. Yep. And. Um, he uh, he discovered this this sketch of a of a jet bomber or a twin engine jet fighter um, that that Frank Whittle drew up in 1938, and and the, the the thread of the story is if only the boring old government and and brass had listened to him, then we would have had a jet fighter to conquer the Luftwaffe and the Blitz, and the Blitz would never have happened. So it drew up that in 1938. When did Rolls Royce start development of the Merlin? Yeah. And then when did they get it into successful mass production? <laughs> yeah. What's that's a decade, right? That takes a decade, because well, it's but, certainly it's certainly a lot more than two years. Well, the be- the best part of a decade, because after all, the flight, the fight, the, the specification that leads to the Hurricane and um, the Spitfire is in light of Rolls Royce's developing engine, and you know you're going to have to use this. This is the engine you're going to use for this right. plane. Yeah. So. And that's 1935. That spec is drawn up, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you have to also remember that that, that the Merlin is a development of, the, of, I think it was the Goshawk. Is it the Goshawk engine, and uh, or the Eagle or something, or one of those. Yeah, one yeah. of those. It's, it's, a, it's basically a development. It's an upgrade. Yeah, a, a pretty big upgrade, but it's still an upgrade of, a, of an existing inline piston engine. Yeah. Whereas Whittle's Whittle's engine is completely brand new. Yeah, and the, and the problem is, is it's not just a question of coming up with the idea. You've then got to make it. You've then got to test it. Yeah, you've then got to refine it because it's not going to work immediately. Um, and and then you've got to create the machine tools to make it. And then you've got to get it produced. Then yeah. you've got to train people on it. Um, and then it's got to come into development. And you have to remember that the Spitfire, with its first test flight on a, although it is a modern and completely new monoplane, you know, stress metal plane, is still a kind of you know, it's traditional in so much that it's piston engine. Yeah. Uh, um. You know, the reason there aren't enough Spitfires in the Battle of Britain is because it's taken that long to, to produce it and develop yes. it and all the rest of it. Four years on, more than four years on. Yes. Uh, um, so the idea that a jet engine would be ready if it had been backed in 1938 on the basis of a sketch and, and some and some um, equations is just absolute la-la land. Yeah, it doesn't. It 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 doesn't stand up, does it? And and the no. thing is, is and the thing is, is. Also, if the air ministry and the uh, boffin uh, and you know the brass in the civil service and the war in the war office and everyone hadn't listened to you know if only they listened they produ- they were producing jets by the end of the war and uh, for the you know we were giving them away post war we yeah. were doling them out to whoever wanted them including the Soviet Union the Russians <laughs> you know like uh, uh, because because because, <laughs> the, because Jet development was about what we do after the war, as much as it was what we do during the war. Because because any scientific any any development period doesn't end on the eighth of May. It's a sort of it, it's that's an arbitrary cut off, isn't it? Because after all, let's say you think the war might last until nineteen forty eight, then then the skies will be full of jets yeah. in nineteen forty six seven eight. But it doesn't. It ends in 1945. And, and, yeah. and one of the reasons is because the Allies concentrate on the things that work. You know, the, the, Merlin, uh, the Merlin engine is then developed into the Griffin. And you have the, you know, the best. You, you basically take piston engine fighters as far as they can possibly go. And then you've got jets next waiting. You know, it's it's yes. it, it's it's 
It's a very... Also, the other thing is that Whittle's developing a turbojet, whereas by the end of the war, you know, um, Rolls-Royce are uh, developing the Axle Flow turbojet. Um, yeah. um, Axle Flow is developed by A.E. Griffiths in 1928. Um, uh, and there's an argument that, is, that his invention of Axle Flow is every bit as important to the development of jet technology as as Whittle's first jet engine in the first place. Yeah. You know, it's, it's, on, it's certainly on a par. No one remembers Griffith at all. Everyone, all everyone remembers is Whittle is about, about how, how he was he hit a brick wall of bureaucracy, which he didn't. Uh, no. and, you know, the whole thing is just a, it's one of those kind of sort of myth stories. And, and what you also have to remember is is that very you know by I think in nineteen forty three, Whittle has been frozen out because he's a complete control freak. He's having a breakdown because he has been such a control freak and because he's overworked so much. He's not a businessman, so his business has completely failed. Rover are absolutely yeah. hopeless, which actually this article, to be fair, does point out. Yeah. Uh, um, and, and you know, his, his early developments of the engine have been taken on by de Havilland and by Bristol and by, by yeah. Rolls-Royce, who are better equipped, better better suited, and, and have have the, the necessary boffins to be able to take it on to the next But level, what's interesting about the article is it says, oh, Rover were hopeless, <laughs> right? Oh, you know, no one took it seriously. Rover were hopeless. Yes, so they took it off Rover. If... Right. If, they'd, if, if they'd really not been listening, if they'd really not been interested in developing jet engine, it would have stayed at Rover. But they went, yeah. no, actually, uh, uh, Rover are the wrong people to be doing this. We'll give it to Rolls Royce because also because Rolls Royce are looking are looking a lot further down the line because they're because they're an aero engine manufacturer rather than a car manufacturer being pressed into war ma- uh, war manufacturing production on a thing they're not expert at. Yeah. It's all, it's all like. Well, in fact, that's the right thing to have happened. That they put it to yeah. Rover because it's less important than getting piston engine and churning out Merlins. And you're churning out Merlins to the point you're putting them in in AFEs. After all, you're putting them in tanks because you've got so many of the bloody things. But the- yes, but the the other reason they went to Rover is because Whittle wanted to have have you know basically complete control over it. Yeah. Yeah, uh, um, but in addition to getting Seb Ritchie on, we really must get Hermione. Try and get Hermione. Yeah, 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 yeah. Well, there's lots. Of, you know, if we if we go tier nine or whatever, uh, do us next, but there'll be plenty yep. of time for all this sort of thing. Right now, um, uh, a quick reminder: we do the show live on the internet in front of a baying crowd. Um, uh, well, the. Ma- the, yeah, a baying crowd every Thursday night. Do come along and sample the atmosphere. We're making the first couple um, of the year open house. So non-members are welcome. So you don't have to be signed up to our Patreon. Um, but go to the Patreon. So that's P-A-T-R-E-O-N, patreon.com slash we have ways for more information. That will show you the way to get onto the live cast. Um, you, don't, you won't need to be a member for the first couple because we want... We want um, the not quite as afflicted as the seriously afflicted to uh, get a you know get a whiff of the whiff of the stench of uh, Thursday night Second World War talk. Now, one thing we've been talking about, and we mentioned it in the in the first half, is aerial photography. And a couple of weeks ago, we talked about some aerial photographs that you've got of uh, of the of the D Day. The first D Day battle, the Sherwood Rangers are involved in. So D Day to yep. sort of the first five days. And where do you get the photos? First of all, where do you get the photos from? Because you've gone down, you've gone down the rabbit hole, haven't you, James? You, you've yes, basically I have vanished. Oh my god! I, I just well, okay. So I've gone to the National Collection of Aerial Photography, um, yep. which is <coughs> excuse me is held in Edinburgh, um, and this place is is just oh my goodness! What what an amazing resource it is. So for twenty five quid a year. You can tap it. You can. There's a search engine, so you write in, I yep. don't know, La Hamel or Aramont yep. or yep. you know, Colville Sumer or whatever you want to put yeah, in, yeah. and up comes an unbelievably large number of photographs taken from the air, and it says the date when they're taken. Some of them are taken before D-Day, some are taken on D-Day. But you know, whatever. Yeah. You know, yeah. battles during the Second World War, and. If you've paid your twenty five quid, you can then click on that and you can enhance it, and you can only get to three hundred dpi um which is quite good but not super duper good yeah, yeah if you if you want the highest resolution you can effectively get is 1200 dpi which yeah. is super sharp and and that costs a kind of mouth-wateringly large amount of money so you want to be kind of judicious with how many you buy of those but just the service for your 25 quid per annum is incredibly good and i'm yeah. just i'm i mean you know i'm i'm a bit like a sort of you know a parent who's had a child for the first time there's that kind of sort of wonder uh, of the <laughs> miracle of it and you assume that no one else has ever gone through what you've gone through yeah um, yeah uh, and 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 so i'm kind of sort of 
I, I'm just amazed that I haven't done this before and, and slightly kind of ashamed of myself. But at the same time, still kind of just loving the wonder of it. And, and yeah. it is... It is absolutely. I mean, you know, someone else we should go is, is talk to one of the archivists there and, and 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 find out a bit more about it. But it's fascinating, and I've been trying to. The the problem we were talking about the other day was this sort of how you piece together what actually happened from war diaries which are unreliable yeah. and from personal recollections which are unreliable. It's yeah. it's fine on the general overview, and you know that that you know when someone got shot up in his tank, you know, and he took cover in a barn or whatever, you know that that story is true. The difficulty is trying to piece all this together in connection with other things that are going on because the timings yeah. of it are really, really hard. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the great thing about photographs, of course, is that photographs don't lie. Um, and, and they definitely don't t lie at all. And first of all, you, you know, it's possible to kind of track down when these flights took place because of um, operational record books, which is equivalent to sort of squadron diaries and, and, you know, records in the US as well. Because, in fact, actually, these D-Day ones were taken by, by the US Ninth Air Force. Uh, reconnaissance payments rather than RAF ones. Yeah. But you can also do it by looking at shadows and by measuring the shadows and where they are and all the rest of it. So, um, and I was helped enormously by the completely brilliant Steve Fisher, who's a marine um, archaeologist and is doing amazing work on the um, LCT that they've got down at the D-Day yeah. Museum. Yeah. Um, and he's kind of working all that out. So he's been going into all this stuff forensically. Um, and he's put me right on a whole load of stuff a and um, a has also given me the, the times, which I've then double checked with someone else and with another source. And he's absolutely spot on. So there's three timings on there, which three codes on there. There's 1743, yeah. there's 1734 and the 1742. And then this does not respond, uh, correspond to the time of the afternoon. It is just a sortie code. And ah. and and so seventeen forty three is ten thirty to eleven a.m. Right. Seventeen thirty four is um, eleven thirty to midday. Right. And seventeen forty two is one to one thirty. Right. Okay. Right. And, and and then you start looking at this stuff, and very very interesting and well, different. So what we're going to do... Things, what, come on. So what, what we're going to do is we're going to do is we're going to look at these. Now, um, if you're listening to the podcast, it's normal form. Um, we will make sure these photos go up, I um, uh, 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 think, somewhere. On inst somewhere. Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, our new Facebook page, somewhere. They'll go up. So you can have a look at what we're talking about. But what and we're just also... hope that the National National Collection of Aerial Photography don't come... Yeah, shut up, James! And... Shut up, James! But what we're, also, what we're also going to do is we're recording this Zoom conversation. So we're going to put the pictures up. And so there will be, uh, there will be, uh, you'll be able to look at these pictures while we talk about them. Um, uh, I think that's what our patrons will be getting, but th this will leak eventually. This will leak out into the, into the in internet ether. So what we're going to do now is we're going to go through some of these um, super high resolution photographs. And, uh, well, James, you talked through what you took, talk through what you can see. So number one. Uh, pictures uh, Anel and Le Hamel at ten thirty hours to eleven hundred hours on D Day. Yeah, and so this this is a seventeen forty three one, right? Um, okay, and, and and it's fascinating. So if you go to the kind of, sort of top to the right of the centre at the top, yep. yeah, you can see a crossroads. Yes. So, I mean, to, to, to someone not immediately, not with this in front of them, what you've got is an aerial photograph taken from what? I don't know, 20,000 feet, something, something like, like that. that. Yep. Um, and it's what we have is the layout of roads. And is this, is this photo or oriented north to south? What yes, we it looking is. At? Yep. 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 Completely. So north at the top, south at the bottom, <laughs> east and west as they go. Right. And there's a road running the, uh, on the on the on the. Uh, right hand side of the image so on the eastern side of the image there's a road running all the way down into um uh there's that la hamel that it's running down into that's anel on the left yeah so it, sort of roughly kind of east west to east is is the kind of is the, the lateral road so if you go to yeah. the very top yeah uh, and just off off you know uh, uh, sort of if you divide it into 10 sort of at six going yeah. from from left to right just above the crossroad, you can see what's clearly the edge of a crater. Yep. And I, I'm just just take my word for it, that is a crater. Right, and, okay. and And just beyond that is the beach and the sea. 
Yeah. So, so okay. this is an inch in land. I mean, this is really, you know, that crossroad so, is a matter of a hundred yards from the beach. So that road, so that road running um, left to right at the top is basically the road off the road back from the beach that when you come up off the beach, that's the road right. that runs parallel to the coast. Correct. And if you keep going west, what you'll do is you'll climb up over the hill up to where there's yep. another strong point, um, WN yep. 39 and 38, where the radar station was, where you can still yep. go up there now and look at the remains of the Mulberry Harbour and all the rest of it. And that yeah, will yeah. then drop down into Aramanch, you know, a couple of miles yep. away. Yeah, so yeah. what you've got here, so, so it's worth just sort of orientating yourselves around this, this photograph. You can also see this sort of, you know, sort of triangular kind of gash in the, that has been carved out of the of the ground on the kind of left top left hand side of the picture. Yeah, and, and, and that is an anti tank ditch protecting WN thirty seven, which is at Le Hamel, and you can just start seeing the top of Le Hamel in the top left hand corner. Yeah, but but most of its defences are on on the on the. Um, are so that on the so, shelf. so that sort of the hockey shelf. stick shaped the, the hockey stick shape yes. is an anti tank ditch. That's an anti tank that, 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 ru- that runs across the that runs across the village, across the houses, and then scoops back up um, uh, to the west. Gosh, yes. so that's that's a, I mean that that's a that's a major um, work, isn't it? To to cut through um, uh, 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 that landscape, isn't it? It's not yeah. work though, because it's not work though, has it? Because I'm looking at what I'm looking at on the north to south road on the uh, on the eastern side of this photograph is a load of tanks, isn't it? That that are yeah. that are heading south. Yeah, and it's not and it's not just any old tanks either. So if you go from <coughs> if you go from kind of from from south to north, um, you, you're getting into Asnel itself, and you can yep. see that you can see the village, um, and just on that first road, just just before the second junction. Yeah. Um, you, you can see what is clearly a Sherman tank, but this is extraordinary, James. I can, you can, you, you know, I've zoomed in on this photograph as you sent it to me uh, uh, on the hundred percent zoom in. Yeah. So you know, much much bigger than my monitor could ever could ever uh, accommodate, and you can clearly see the skirts on the DD tank. You can clearly make out that you know, unless that's something on the road that looks like a seventeen pounder on the on the firefly there you can yeah. clearly make and, and that that must be you can see the open fighting compartment of the sexton yep uh uh which is amazing well the Gosh. interesting thing is if you then go to if you go to the second photograph which is from the yeah, same okay. seat which is which is a which okay. is um so that is now that's 1734 so that is um that's a little bit bit later yeah you can see the shadows on that. So the sun's come out. Yeah. So this is from 11.30 to 12 p.m. Yeah. And we know this because we know that the sun did come out around midday. <laughs> but we can also tell that from the shadows. So this is not the first squadron. This is not the first troop of tanks to come in. This is not part of that same column that we've yeah. just seen. This is a new one. And what you can see, if you go into the bottom kind of quarter, bottom left-hand yeah. corner, you can actually yeah, yeah. see a troop of tanks coming through. So well, coming f- past that church building again. <coughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So but, 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 yes, but but if you go, if you can, you if you go into the real, you see that sort of black splodge in the bottom left-hand corner, yeah. and then go yeah. into that road. Yes, yes, there's yes, a tank. Yes, That's yes. the lead tank. Yeah. No infantry. Yeah. Okay. So the infantry are crossing over these fields to our right. Yeah. And and they're not there, so there's no infantry support, which is why you've got this this tank in patrol formation. With a scout up front, he's on point, and the others then two close together, yeah. and a third yeah. and a fourth one. So it's just really interesting because you're seeing them doing exactly what they should be doing. Yeah, which is not all clumping together. You've got someone up up ahead, you know, a hundred yards ahead, fifty yards ahead. Okay, well, so let's look at let's look at the, well. Number so three. now let's go to the third photo, which is um, La Hamel Jig Green. So what we have, well, we have the beach, right. So this is taken as the same time as number two that we've just looked at. Right. Okay, so this is, this is your kind of 11.30 to midday photograph. Um, yeah. and, and, and what I like about this one is now you can see the whole of the beach. You can see, you can see Jig Green. So if you go, you, you can now see the crater north of the, of the crossroads that I mentioned really, really clearly. Yeah. You can yes. also see the lateral road going all the way along. And if you go to the next turning down towards the beach... That yep. is WN36, or what remains of it, 
and as you can see, it's yeah. been absolutely smashed to pieces. Yes, yeah, but yeah, so, there's, so there's a strong point um, at the other end of that lateral road, uh, yeah. beyond, north of the crater. That is Lahamo, and that is where you know that is one strong yeah. point. Then there's the next one, and just after that, before you get to the LCT, that is the end of Jig Green and becomes Jig Red. And then, can you see south of WM36 that road yeah. curving down, and then it disappears off down yeah. towards the south? Okay, yeah, that yeah. is the road which, which according to the war diary, is which was was taken by a squadron. But right. we know that isn't entirely true because we've seen the photos of Anel with non DD Shermerson, and they can be only um, from the Sherwood Rangers. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's that one. Yeah. So anyway, so you get a, this one's good because you get a much bigger picture. So let's look on to let's go on to number four. Yeah, yeah, sure. God, this is so interesting. So this is. Um, uh, this is at one o'clock, one to one thirty. Right. Yeah. And again, what's great about this is you can see you can see lots of traffic on all the roads if you look if you kind of home in. But what you can also see is all the all the um, uh, all the knocked out tanks on Jig Green, which is between you know WM thirty six and, and thirty seven, yeah, yeah. and all the rest of it. So so th- there's that one. But the my favourite almost is Gosh. is is the number five, which is the oblique okay. photo. And this okay. is really interesting because, I mean, just look at, first of all, just look at the quality of that photograph. It is absolutely <laughs> it's awesome. It's extraordinary. And you can see that this is taken from a Lightning, um, a P-38. And you yeah. can also see that it's sunny. So, again, you can see that this is, this is 1 to one thirty in the afternoon. Yeah. Um, which is really interesting. But, but let's do some homing in. So if you, if you home in on the lateral road and La Hamel and the tanks on the beach. Yeah. Okay. Now... You can see that crater. You can see you can see the Hamel really clearly. You can see the seawall really, really clearly. Yeah. And that little curve. Okay. Yeah. Now, just on the on the apex of the curve, <coughs> uh, um, uh, where it curves and where it faces now faces back out to sea. That is where that casement was that housed a seventy-seven millimeter gun. Right. Now the interesting thing is when and then behind that you can you see some big buildings. Yeah. Uh, right on the on on the seawall, <coughs> yeah. there's some really substantial buildings there. That is yes, a sanatorium yeah, yeah, yeah. complex. That's the sanatorium, isn't it? Yeah, that's so the that, sanatorium. That, that, yeah. So isn't that fascinating? That is amazing, James. It really, Absolutely really is extraordinary. It really is. And of course, what you can now do is marry up this with Google Earth, and yeah, you can go, yeah, yeah, yeah. oh, okay, and then you can start to work out measurements and stuff, and then you marry that up with the with the wartime maps. And bingo, you've yeah. you've got your absolutely. I mean, gosh, what a resource! <laughs> yeah. you know, it's just incredible. And how many fo- how many photographs are there in this uh, uh, archive? Oh, I don't know. There's you know zillions. I mean, absolutely zillions. Z- yeah, an actual, sort of in. actually, actually zillions. That's the actual your actual number. I mean. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that real number <laughs> zillion. Um, <laughs> well, that's absolutely fascinating. We hope that um, those of you who managed to have a look at those pictures. Um, I mean, I, I think. What we're saying made enough sense without being able to see them, but we, you'd be much better off having a look at them. Um, that's it for this bumper New Year's edition, where we've covered all sorts of ground. Um, we've got a final book reading from uh, tomorrow, which is from Robert Bowen's Fighting with the Screaming Eagles, um, which is the most incredible account of being a prisoner after the Ardennes battle in Germany. Um, uh, then on Thursday, there's a sensational diary from an RAF man who was seconded to the photo reconnaissance unit and found himself based on the continent in 3940. Just the most amazing uh, uh, and sent in last week thing. Wasn't it? That, yeah, Sid Cotton's private air force, basically. And we're live streaming on Thursday night. Join us for Harry Birrell, Films of Love and War, 8:30 p.m. UK time. That's open to all, not just to the uh, seriously afflicted. Thank you so much for listening. Happy New Year once again. Cheerio. Cheerio.